Hello and welcome to the Federal. I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay and you are watching our program Off the Beaten Track in which we go much beyond what is there in the headlines. Today we will be talking about history. The reason why we will be talking about history is because the Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his uh, address to the nation on the occasion of uh, Independence Day from the Red Fort, the ramparts of the Red Fort, he spoke a lot about history. He talked about a thousand years of history of slavery. He talked about his tenure as some kind of a transitory phase. And then he talked about quite ominously about a thousand years of golden period ahead. To help me understand about his speech, the politics of history, the understanding of history of the current political regime, I have with me uh, Professor Mridula Mukherjee, one of the most senior historians in the country. She has been a professor and the head of uh, the Center of Historical Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. She's also been the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. At least at that time, that is what it was called. It no longer has the name of Nehru in it. You know, So it's one of the many things that is being dropped, that is being changed many things of our history which is being altered. So welcome to the program, uh, Professor Mridula Mukherjee, and uh, thank you for sparing time and coming and speaking with us on such an important subject, history, because a lot of politics is being founded on the basis of history. Thank you, Nilanjan. Uh, glad to be back on your program. Yes, it's really welcome to talk to you once again. Uh, let me start with you what I was talking in the introduction. The Prime Minister in his speech, you know, besides, besides other things which a lot of people have said, that he's made a promise that he's going to be addressing the nation once again, which means that it's trying to show his uh, confidence or what uh, I would like to call an overconfidence of uh, being re-elected uh, once again in the 2024 Lok Sabha elections. But he talked about a thousand years of history, 1,200 years of history in the past, which is a period of slavery. This is something which he's actually talked about in his electoral speeches for a long time, for at least about 10, 12 years. I've been hearing the same thing right from the time of 2011, 12, when he started making a bid to become the prime minister of the country. Very recently, during his visit to the United States, while addressing the US Congress, there officially as the prime minister of India, he talked about India, becoming independent in 1947 after more than a thousand years of quote-unquote foreign rule. Mind you, the reason why I'm specifying is that he spoke as prime minister, even from the Red Fort, he spoke as prime minister. Then he talks about a transitory period. This is a new introduction. The transitory period is basically his signature happening under his. He's the one who's actually taking out from the period of slavery, which means that prior to 2014, everything is also a period of slavery. After the transitory period, which is also calling Amrit Kal, you know, from now to 2047, is when the basic germination is going to be done for the next 1000 years. It has, of course, uh, you know, it, it reminds us all about the 1934 proclamation of Adolf Hitler of talking about a thousand years of uh, German history, the, the Reich not getting uh, destabilized at all. As a historian, how do you look at this kind of labeling of these pasts, you know, the past as uh, as a period of slavery, the current period as of transitory? You cannot really decide how future historians are going to be talking about what will be their analysis of the contemporary, the history of this time. Also, how can one actually talk about what will be the future history? I am asking these questions purely as a layman. Somebody who has very deep interest in history, but I would like to Well, Neil Kanjan, I think, uh, uh, you know, when I hear you and your questions, uh, it's very clear to me as a historian that this is not about history at all. Okay. It, it has nothing to do with what, what we think is history or the kind of history writing we do or the kind of history teaching we do or the kind of historical research we do. This is right. pure and simple politics construct which is meant to further the political agenda and aims of uh, the regime that happens to be in power today and even when they were not in power 
this is a long term agenda which the rss uh, stroke now bjp earlier jansang earlier hindu masaba you know what we call the hindu communal forces at one time before independence Uh, this has been their agenda for a long time. It's nothing new. I'm talking now about the thousand-year-old right. uh, slavery, right. and uh, I think it's very important to remember that that this is not new. What is new is that it's being proclaimed from authoritative government of India's portals, which right. is what makes it worrying. But in terms of their own agenda, I think they've been very clear, and I'll tell you why. Hmm. the entire ideological construct of the rss hindu masaba in the beginning which was the combination at that time rss right. was the behind the scenes uh, volunteer uh, group and army and the electoral wing in a sense was first the hindu sabha and then it became the hindu masaba so it was very clear that their whole understanding of uh what was going on what had gone on and what needed to happen was based on a certain perception of history right so the core of the what we now call the hindutva ideology right. is a certain view of indian history in which there are two basic principles mm-hmm. one that we had a glorious pre islamic past right from the beginning of time if you like till the muslim hordes as they called them came right. uh, we had this pure unalterated beautiful glorious uh, civilization so in right? india as they say in hindi and after the uh, muslim uh, hordes came islam came you know uh, with the, as they said with quran in one hand and a sword in the other other that's how it's still written in rss school textbooks you know how islam right. came to india from then on began begins this period of enslavement where the picture is unadulterated picture of hindus being suppressed hindu society being suppressed hindus being forcibly converted in large numbers mm. hindu women being ravaged you know the whole picture of a suppressed hindu society which then remained suppressed till well Thousand years, twelve hundred years, they vary. Two hundred years means nothing. It seems in their uh, rhetoric, Modi, Modi ji himself sometimes says hundred, sometimes says twelve hundred, sometimes they say that you know they they sort of say that with independence that slavery ended. But now, as you are pointing out, the tendency is to say that it's really from two thousand fourteen, because after all, Hindu. ideology and a party which avowedly subscribes to that ideology has only come to unadulterated power from 2014 so i think there's a whole attempt to now construct a slightly different a variation of that basic construct but it's important to know that rss cadres bjp followers jansang uh you know cadres and all and and of course before independence this is what they have been taught fed they have believed in this has been the raison d'etat of their desire to reestablish a hindu rashtra the ancient which, india is seen as a hindu rashtra which was destroyed and now you have to reassert that can i can i just be you know play the devil's advocate uh, uh what's wrong with this theory after all uh, the uh, muslim uh, rulers were actually invaders they came from outside and uh, prior to the mughal dynasty the most of them came here plundered went back like it was to and fro back and forth movement also that a large number of conversions took place so uh, you know a lot of today's uh, muslims are not all not every muslim in india today would trace their ancestry to the lands outside of india in from where the the various uh, you know emperors came so how exactly is this uh, argument of theirs faulty okay now what's wrong with this picture of uh, india let's say from about the second millennium ad right. roughly 
is that one, it's uh, historically completely false that Islam came to India through invaders in the north. Right. Islam first comes to India, in fact, on the Kerala coast. Right. By the sea route. And by the sea route. And it started happening almost simultaneously with uh, the life of the Prophet. Right. In fact, there is enough evidence to show that Islam reached the shores of India and significant population of these traders who came, they often married into local, uh, uh, you know, families, etc. and settled down what the people that we know as the Maplas. Right. Their origin, Malabar, the Malabar coast, Malabar, Malabar, yes. Kerala, not That's Kerala right. touching not towards Kerala. Goa. That's right. With Calicut as the kind of... Uh, touching towards Karnataka too. Right? Sorry? Mistake I said Goa, it's touching Karnataka. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No. So this is this is very clear. Secondly, there is to Sindh also. Uh, Islam came much earlier. It came in the 8th century. Okay. Okay. And there was in fact significant uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, population right. which came there and in fact established their rule over there. And there is no evidence of the kind of thing that we have in the north of what we look at as the invasions, repeated invasions by Muhammad Ghazni to plunder, etc. No. Okay. So there's a, in fact, so we have to go back three or four hundred years at least to tell the story of Islam in India. Yeah, I'll just, then, inter sorry. I'll just uh, interrupt here. I think, you know, you referred to this, you know, Islam coming to India in Sindh towards the 8th or the 9th century. I think... Uh, would you think that, you know, this is what Modi was referring to in his speech when he says that there is a small kingdom which actually gets invaded at that time. We did, do not understand, did not understand that it has actually set in motion a, a long, uh, you know, millennium long period of. No, invasion. no, no. I How think I think he's, he was probably referring to the defeat of Prithviraj Chauhan. Okay. Because that is the iconic. He's iconic, you know, the last battle which. Yeah, which is there very deep in the historiography of that is why Prithviraj Chauhan is valorized also, you yes, know, all kinds of stories. He is a quintessential Hindu Rajput uh, to boot king. There who was was also, there's also a film of Prithviraj, you know, last year, you know, very fortunately it bombed, which means that the people did not really appreciate the ahistorical story right. of the film. <laughs> That's right. So then, of course, we come to the north and, you know, we come then to the 11th and 12th centuries AD. Right. When this, the next kind of installment of this story happens. And here it is uh, two, two, big, two important names are associated with what are called the Islamic invasions. Right. One is Muhammad Ghori. Right. And one is Muhammad of Ghazni. Right. Okay. Now with Ghazni, we know that he was, he came many times into India. Right. And he did conduct raids, essentially plundered and went back. He was not interested in settling down and establishing a, a, a regime kingdom. over here, a, you know, a kingdom or a sultanate or whatever. Muhammad Ghori, slightly less, there were two twice that he came, but even then, so there's about a period of a hundred years or so when we have these sporadic incursions. Right. After that comes the Sultanate. Right. You know, which, so I would say that in fact, from the end of the 12th century, you know, early 13th century, right. you, the business of foreigners who go away ends. Like because they come once the Sultanate is established, with the with the you know uh, Alauddin Khilji, you know who sets up his administration over here, who sets up a whole new revenue system, he sets up a whole new financial system, and very important because these were long term interventions into the social and economic life of northern India, and mm -hmm. also goes southwards and the sultan. The area under the so-called Muslim rulers expands significantly. This okay. process through a succession of dynasties continues till the 15th and almost the 16th centuries. Mm -hmm. The last of the important dynasties in that are the Lodis. Right. And then come the Mughals. 
and mm. of course in between you know you have the tugluk very important yes, figure rosha tugluk and all those and uh, iltatmish his daughter razia begum so there is this period which is not by any means one of unalloyed persecution and oppression okay yes nobody denies and why should you deny that conversions took place conversions did take place conversions however in india largely took place with through the it's very interesting through the sufis that's right okay. you know not yes. so much the coincided with power. the bhakti movement also that's right not so much the political power and they took place we must remember in those communities who saw themselves as on the margins of hinduism right and not beneficiaries of the religion but in a sense victims of the religion so people at the bottom of the uh, social hierarchy you know the what we now call the scheduled castes or dalits people who we some of them who we now called obcs you know weavers and artisans in the towns because in the early period the control and administration was much more in the towns so you will find large settlements of muslims in north indian towns and right. typically the artisanal class which was directly serving the rulers making weapons making their clothes making their daily goods you know carpenters this that there's a lot of conversion that happens in these communities there's there's hardly any evidence of conversion among the upper castes brahmins rajputs or even banias or castes the vast majority of the conversion is at the lower levels of society and that tells us something it's about American why it might have happened because islam offered a brotherhood yeah. and this is the basis of the pasmanda discourse within the muslim community in india at the moment this right and in the, in the same way that buddhism appealed to the lower castes right to some extent to the merchant castes also because they were not part of the upper caste uh, favored right. hierarchy you know so i think it's important to bring this in not denying that the force of the state was also used and was behind this right okay then we come to the uh, sure. to the period of the moguls you know and that's a we come to a different story altogether right. because after the initial babar was here very briefly for right. years right. and humayu was here and not here was defeated you know so really it's yeah it's in the middle of the 16th century 1556 that akbar uh, then the ascends throne. the reign yeah. and uh, the the throne and that is from where we can really start talking about what was the character of mogal rule right and it is a completely new kind of concept that akbar brings uh, to islamic if you like uh, power in india where the whole approach at over time becomes even more is very syncretic there's an effort a serious effort to win over different sections of the population there's a serious effort not only to win over people belonging to different religions but also communities and clans for example his rajput policy right. where he tried to win over the rajput kingdoms rather than only be fighting yes. against them and he succeeded and the whole idea was to integrate the existing ruling classes into the mogal administrative structure and that is what happened and that's what and you know i mean raja man singh i mean the names are legion they occupied the highest positions in the mogal court uh, the navratna of uh, for example the nine jewels of akbar's court you know bir baltan se man so, singh i think they were all for a composite uh, from a composite uh, uh, ethnic religious backgrounds so you know hindus hindus were uh, part of the ruling class during the mughal period very much uh, very briefly uh, aurangzeb aurangzeb is the real villain you know people are fine yeah. so, they accept but we have to Akbar. we have to remember aurangzeb yes. comes at the fag end of mughal rule that's right okay so 1556 to 1660s that's right when aurangzeb comes you know you have a long period more than a century akbar jahangir shah jahan right, right. and mughal mughal empire is actually well established by by the middle of akbar's rule and certainly by the end of his rule 
in a very large part of the subcontinent, including the South. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to remember that the relationships between the Mughal court, the Mughal regime, the Mughal ruling class, and the existing ruling dynasties, ruling classes, ordinary people of India were very different from what is projected. Okay. Mughal rule was accepted by the Indian people as their own. Right. It is not, just to give you one example, why did the Sepoys in 1857, when they rebelled against the British, what why we call the, the mutiny, you know, which is yeah. not a mutiny, but a revolt from Meerut, when they came through the night riding and right. crossed the river Jamna and go straight to the Mughal emperor and say, you will be our leader. Because right. they saw the Mughal emperor, even though he was had been powerless for more than 150 years almost, right? you know, and certainly a century, as still being a symbol of Indian rule. Right. Okay, so we have to accept that the Mughals did succeed in indigenizing themselves, if you like the word, right. sufficiently to be accepted by wide sections of the Indian people, including the ruling classes, as their legitimate rulers, not as outsiders. So I think this is very important because the whole rhetoric is of foreigners, outsiders. Right. Secondly, I want to say that if we go away from just looking at history at the top, you know, ruling right. classes and middle, all that, I think what's very important is if we look at the social and cultural life in India, mm -hmm. what is happening at the level of how people, for example, practice their religion, how they live their religion. From the 12th, 13th century onwards, the Bhakti movement begins. That's right. And it begins and it comes up in all parts of India through different representatives. Right. If it is Kabir over here, it is uh, in the in the south, in Maharashtra, there's Eknath, there's this, that I could go on, you know. Everywhere, they, it with the different representatives, but with the same idea, Chaitanya in Bengal, That's you know, right. of rejecting organized religion and having a direct link with God. And the same is also the Sufi, uh, you know, idea, the way of thinking also becomes very prevalent. So what is very interesting is, if you were to actually do an anthropological kind of study mm. at the level of the people, how they are living their lives, they are living very syncretic lives most of the time. People mm. are going to dargahs, people are going to mazars, and from different religions. And okay. you do not see that any evidence of ongoing persistent religious conflict happening at the level of the people. Otherwise, there would be evidence of that. Right. You know, so I think it's very important that we recognize that through, in fact, those, uh, let's say, six, seven hundred years, if you like, you know, from about the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and into the 18th century. And 18th century, the Mughal power declines from the center, mm -hmm. but the successor states of the Mughals, Awad, the Nawab of Awad, the Nizam in Hyderabad, you know, the Bengal Sultanate, these, these successor states, even then they were Muslim, right. were very syncretic. Wajid Ali Shah is a very good example of what the culture was in the 18th century. Wajid Ali Shah is seen to be one of the pioneers in Hindustani music yes. and dance today. You, you teach Vajjari Shah two papers in Delhi. In fact, the film, in fact, the film of Satyajit Ray Shatrinj Ke Khiladi, there is a remarkable line where Vajid Ali Shah, you know, the character Amjad Khan playing the role of Vajid Ali Shah, he actually tells the representative of the British crown that, tell me one king in your country whose lines are recited by the people with love and passion. You know, that is what... Uh, Syncretism was all about. That that brings to mind just one, one sentence. Yes. Amir Khusro. That, yes. Again, 14th century. That's you right. You know, uh, Nehru writes in the discovery of India that it is amazing that the songs and the poems of Amir Khusro are still sung and recited in the villages of North India. Right. And this is in the... 20th century. And yes. we know even today, we know how popular 
Amir Khusro's, uh, you know, poems and songs are. We all know them. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad that you 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 reminded me of that kind of had uh, slipped out of you know, mind. And that for wouldn't a long have time. happened unless it had spread. That's right. You know, unless it had really spread at the popular level. So I think popular culture is where we need to look, not just in terms of ruling classes. Look at the armies. It is it is the, it is a what shall I say? It's a known fact that armies were completely mixed. Hindu kings had large and, numbers of Muslims in their Muslim army, king. like did Shivaji. And yes, vice versa, Muslim kings had, they had to have. Could they have fought the battles without the Hindu no, school? Definitely not. You definitely know, so there, there was never any question of discrimination or separation at so many levels at which society actually worked on an everyday basis. Now, let, let me ask you a question, you know, related to this. As a historian, how do you react to this repeated argument, which argument we call it, or the story which uh, Mr. Modi or other BJP leaders talk about, the kind of events that are happening, what history we will have. We will have a history of a golden period, thousand years of golden period. As a historian, can you foresee into the future? You know... Anybody who knows anything about what's happening, what we have done to ourselves in terms of the environment with climate change, the, I right. mean, I, I, I feel very reluctant to even project whether we will survive as a species, whether we will survive as a, you know, a people at all on this planet given what we are doing to ourselves and what shape it would take. That's what I would be worrying about in terms of my future. I right. wouldn't be worrying about what political formations are going to come. In any case, I cannot predict those. Right. I can, there, I what I can do is I can only try and strengthen what I think are the positive forces in Indian society and in the world. Right. So that the people who come after us, our children, grandchildren, their children, grandchildren, for as long as the human race survives, Right. get a better life or at least as good a life as we've had and not a worse one. So that's all that we can do in terms of talking about or thinking about the future political uh, right. you know, structures. Of course, even economic structures, who knows? I mean, look at the way mm -hmm. revolutions take place in the economy and technology. We Do we, do we even remember that we didn't have internet till 20 years ago? Yes, exactly. You know, we didn't have mobile phones. So who knows what's going to happen? Exactly. And who knows what kind of social and political structures, technological change, economic change, uh, the, the ecological, right. ecological even more than for probably everything else, what they, what it will dictate. For example, we all know that the climate crisis or I'd say ecological crisis, environmental crisis is right. a world level crisis. We are trying to solve it at national levels, but we all know it can't be done. Right. We it have to cooperate. Solvable. Now, what, what that imperative depends on the nature of the crisis or the threat. We may, the human society may have the intelligence to say we need a world government. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that we can survive as a people. So, so many things are imponderable in the future. I, as a historian, knowing how history moves, there is no predictability about it. Right. You know, there are no givens at all because there are so many factors that are at play. And what actually happens is an unknown, complex relationship of all those that finally leads to a certain kind of change or a certain course in history. And they cannot be either... No, uh, you know, cannot uh, ever be predicted. Predicted. So, so. so it's also, it's also possibly, you know, not possibly, definitely is also the politics of today to say that if you continue to have support in us and continue to elect us, we will ensure that you will have a golden period for the next thousand years. Let see, me move Nilanjan, on to... Nilanjan, only people, you see, if you have... If only in religion or in faith-based ideologies can you talk about, you know, 100,000 years in the past this happened. Because that can only be a matter of faith. It cannot be a matter of scientific investigation. Exactly. Because who knows? Nobody knows today what happened 100,000 years ago. Exactly. Except physicists know, perhaps. 
how the world came into being. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. They still, they will will keep on trying. And nobody can know what it will be thousand years from now. Will the Prime Minister said at one point while inaugurating a hospital, the plastic surgery used to happen in India way back in the ancient, ancient period, you know, and gave the example of Ganesha's head, you know, that was one of the... That's a matter of faith. Uh, let me ask you... a matter of science. Yeah, let me ask you something, you know, as we are uh, beginning to come towards the, the end, fact, end of our program, you know, you know, the BJP has come to this position, you know, of political dominance by claiming that the previous rulers, the slavery period, the rulers, the Muslim rulers, they did a lot of erasure of the past. They destroyed Hindu temples, built mosques. That has been one of the basic things. We saw that happening in Ayodhya. Had it not been for the Ayodhya agitation, the BJP wouldn't have been in the position of strength that it is today. Mr. Modi wouldn't have been the prime minister because he wouldn't have become such a popular leader had Godra uh, carnage not happened. The Gujarat riots not happened and they happened only because people were returning from Ayodhya highly charged up after participating in a Vishwa Hindu Parishad program. There is a different kind of erasure also which we are seeing, which is happening for the last nine years and it looks like it is going to continue for some time. One of the new mem- one of the members of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council wrote an article in the newspaper saying that we must have a new constitution. The government has said that this is not, uh, you know, our position. They've tried to wash their hands, but we know that because it was done in the time of Mr. Vajpayee, that there is this danger to the constitution which is there. Uh, as we are speaking, just a few days back, the Nehru Memorial Library was renamed after, you know, Nehru's name was conveniently dropped. It has now become Prime Minister's uh, Memorial Library. Team Murti Bhavan, as we used to know it, has become a Prime Minister's Museum. So removing Nehru and the position which he had for being the first Prime Minister of the of India, and that too for a very long formative period, for creating structures which continued way beyond his lifespan, even went beyond his daughter's lifespan. So there has been a lot of erasure of the history which is also going on. There might be a destruction of the Gyanwapi Mosque in Varanasi, the Shahi Eidgah in Mathura, and I really do not know how many more mosques are in the list. Vishwa Hindu Parishad at one point had a list which ran into hundreds. Some people said even thousands of, of, of names, you know, places of worship. Mm-hmm. Various other things. So what do you make out of this politics of erasure which is being pursued by the BJP, even while they are criticizing somebody else's pol- policies of erasure? First, let me just say that, you know, I think this whole business of going into the past as a historian, let me say that trying to find out, you know, how many temples were destroyed destroyed and where, where were they and trying to find them out and then rebuilding them, etc, etc. You know, I think uh, we as a mature, independent country, we took a decision in the 1991 when the whole Babri Masjid Sorry. dispute was going on, we passed the law. Places of Worship Act you are talking about. That's right. Which said very sensibly that apart from the Ram Mandir, which already had become a matter of contention, no other such issues were going to be opened. 15th right. August 1947 would be taken date. as the cutoff date whatever was the status of any monument, place of worship at that time would be left untouched. Right. However, what we are seeing now is questioning of that law. Yes. Uh, and and unfortunately, There's a case going on in the Supreme Court challenging its un- yes, constitutionality. Yes. For, once formally made. questioning that law and through other means questioning that law by raising specific issues That's like right. Mathura or Banaras or you know, what have you. So I think this is very retrogressive. I do wish that the courts took a very firm line on this and reasserted the law for the simple reason that this is a Pandora's box. The only purpose it can serve is increased polarization. The only result of that polarization is dividing Indian society. To me, it's an anti-national act. Anything that divides the people of India 
is against the Indian nation. And it would stagnate the economy also. It will stop our development and growth. What happened? Have we forgotten what happened after the destruction of the Babri Masjid? Yes. Have we forgotten the riots that took place all over India? Have we forgotten how much this economy and country lost at that time? You know, so it we are playing with fire, with Manipur, with Haryana. We are just for the sake of the next election. We are putting this country and its people, they're holding them to ransom and, uh, you know, uh, risking their whole future. I, I think that this is absolutely uh, something that should be stopped because let me tell you as a historian, there are, there are all kinds of stories of all kinds. You're if right. you go back into history tomorrow, the Buddhists may say the yes. Hindus destroyed Buddhist temples or you Jain temples. How and far back it was, you have to go. And it was done on a large scale because remember, at one time, Buddhism dominated India. Right. Okay. Hinduism had taken a retreat. It had taken a bath, completely gone into the background. Then when Hinduism was reasserted again, Gupta Empire, this, that and the other, they did destroy on a large scale. It is well known. It is documented. Right. So what are we going to do? <laughs> are we going to now find out whether if, you know, for example, this becomes a Dalit issue, let's say. In, where, fact, in fact, Buddhist organizations had filed a petition on Ayodhya. Because That's archaeological right. evidence did yeah. suggest that they were Buddhist. So this structure. can lead to a caste divide. Do we want to now increase a caste divide in India on these lines? You know. Secondly, let me also say that the stories of destruction of temples in the medieval period are not untrue, but they are grossly exaggerated. Historians have documented the number of temples that you could actually count and be know in historical sources were destroyed. And what is paraded in the public sphere is something ridiculously exaggerated. No. All right. And also there were many reasons for it. I don't want to go into that story. We've been arguing it for yes. long. Destruction took place not necessarily for religious re reasons or to suppress a people of a religion. To one, for plunder because temples were very rich. They had a lot of gold and diamonds and all that. And invaders, you know, and rulers thought... Also as an expression of authority. And secondly, it's a question of you destroy the... The, the, the temples were, were also signs of the link to the kingship. Right. So if you destroy the idols and you destroy the temples, it's a way of showing your suzerainty over that kingdom, right. whom, which, you have, which you have invaded. So it was a political uh, assertion rather than a religious suppression. But be that as it may, let us accept for a moment that it was religious persecution and religious suppression. Do we want to go back into that story and waste our time? Or do we need to get ahead? No, you know? I, I, I think, you know, that's a very <coughs> direct question which you're asking that even if it was there, do we really need to go and undo the past? It happened not because of of, of uh, you know any action or any decision taken you by any of the famous uh, the famous Sophia mosque church in Istanbul. That's I'm right. sure you know the story. Yes. You know, uh, it was a church for many years. Then for thousand more than a thousand years, then it became a mosque in the medieval period when the Ottomans uh, took over. Right. Then Kamal Pasha, the founder of modern Turkey. He, just, he decided very sensibly to make it into a museum. Right. Neither a mosque nor a church. But the current regime, Erdogan, who is now become... Has Islamic, again revived the old process. Uh, who's now relying on Islamic uh, ideology to, uh, you know, establish and legitimize after. his power as an authoritarian dictator, right. is put it, made it back into a mosque. Into a mosque. You know, so we have so to decide is, which way we want to go. Is that the way we want to go? No, I think, you know, that's a very uh, valid question which you're asking. And I'll unfortunately have to put an end to our conversation here. Rather stop for now. We will definitely resume the conversation once again. Because this is going to be a very lively year ahead of us. Because we have assembly elections in a few months in very important states. We have the parliamentary elections next year. We have the hearing going on on the Places of Worship Act. We have a lot of developments going on in Varanasi and Mathura. So we will continue to require the inputs of a historian to try to make sense of the past, 
to try to understand what the present leadership is doing and also try to understand what kind of projection they are making of the future. Thank you very much, Professor Mridula Mukherjee, for coming and sharing your thoughts and giving us some kind of a perspective as to what to make out of the various assertions, statements and claims of the present leadership over on, on historical matters. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Nilanjan. Subscribe to the Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.